turn with me in your Bibles uh, to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, and then we're going to take chapter 10 today as best we can. Matthew 9, 35 through the end of chapter 10. Well, around the time I graduated from college, a friend from church asked me to come and work for him. This was an exciting opportunity. I really enjoyed serving with this gentleman in the college ministry, and he had a new venture, and he needed someone to come work for him. I had worked alongside him before, and now he was starting a real estate business, and our relationship was going to take a different form. Though we remained friends all throughout the term of my employment, Johnny Fisher had become my boss now from Monday to Friday. He's just a little bit older than me, just a few years. As his only employee at the start of what would become one of the most successful real estate teams in our area within a few years, Johnny had a clear plan for how our new relationship was going to develop. On Monday, he would explain his goals for the week. Very simple. We had a standing 9 o'clock Monday morning meeting. And he would lay out specific tasks that he was delegating to me. And they'd be very open-ended. It might be two words, right? Figure this out. Solve it. <laughs> you have one week to get that done. I have no idea what that entails, but that is your job this week, right? He would try to prepare me for whatever challenges that he could anticipate about that goal. And there was plenty of uncertainty on a Monday. Everything that we were doing was being done at least by us for the very first time. So the most important thing that Johnny said each week was that he trusted me and that he knew I understood his goals and how he intended to do business. Johnny was sending me out into the week as an extension of himself and of his goals, and critically, as an extension of his attitude and approach to success. I was his assistant. I was going out in his name. I had to interface with many people on his behalf. And in essence, I had to become his agent as we worked to build his company, Sweet Home California Real Estate. There's a plug, right? It still exists. Call him up. During those few years, I learned a lot about what it means to represent someone and to represent something and to step outside of myself and to step out in someone else's name. And over the years of working for Johnny, I came to really admire him and the business that he was building. I was no longer motivated simply by a paycheck, but I had real admiration and respect for the one who was sending me. I came to love and care about the success of his business. As we step into Matthew 10, we're going to see how the apostles are sent by Jesus in his name and in the power of His kingdom as His agents, if you will. And Jesus describes what they're being sent out to do, and He prepares them for what they are going to face, and He reminds them of the reward that awaits. And Jesus sends them out as those who will bring the three key aspects of His ministry and His message to bear. First, we will see how Jesus entrusts them with the ministry of deliverance, the ministry of deliverance. Then we'll see how Jesus sends them out in the ministry of dependence, all because the disciples, now apostles, must be able to endure the weight of Jesus' ministry of division the ministry of division. So we'll conclude by considering what it would mean to go with God as these apostles were sent to do. I'm going to do something which I've debated whether or not to do, but I can't figure out how not to do, which is that I'm simply going to read to you the Bible for probably three to five minutes. Just read along with me if you have a copy of the text and inhabit this for a moment, and then we'll take some time to think through what's been said. We'll start in verse 35 of chapter 9. It's the beginning to this section. 
And Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest and send out laborers into His harvest. And He called to Him His twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The name of the twelve apostles are these, first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, John his brother. Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, so give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. And as you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. You'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles." When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, How much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell." Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. 
For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person, because he is a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. It's the word of the Lord. Well, the 10th chapter of Matthew's gospel marks a very big turning point in the narrative. It's a huge change because up until now, Matthew's been focusing on how Jesus has unveiled His own identity, right, through His own words, through His own deeds, the things that He does. But now, Jesus is handing those words and He's handing those deeds down to His disciples, these 12 who will now be referred to as apostles. What's that word mean? It means sent ones, those who've been sent. Where is Jesus sending these apostles? Well, you might think He's sending them out into the world in general, but in fact, that's not the case. Jesus specifically says He's sending these 12 apostles to who? The lost sheep of the house of Israel, to retrieve these original sheep as good shepherds ought to do, right? You get the sense that this is a chief shepherd sending out under shepherds to go and get sheep that are off track, right? A very clear image as to what's happening. God's people may have not been upholding their covenant with God, but God intends to keep His Word to them. Again, we see the heart of God on display right here in the language, even if it is paradoxical. Right from the opening scene, we see that Jesus is sending His apostles as stewards of the ministry of deliverance, the ministry of deliverance. Before Jesus names the 12 apostles and He designates them as the ones that He's going to send, He speaks using this harvest language, right? A very famous passage. We know it well. But it's interesting, those who heard it originally might have had a different context around that harvest language than we do. As Christians, we tend to get our understanding of what harvest means from Jesus Himself, and so we experience that as an evangelism text. When He initially quoted it, it was not that. (laughs) It was understood to be a judgment text out of the Old Testament. Such harvest language was an image that was used to communicate fields that were ripe for what? For God's judgment. Isaiah 27 and Joel chapter 3, the image of a harvest is used to speak of apocalyptic time, the future time of God's unveiling things as they truly are and then of His accompanying judgment. And those who God sends out into that ripe field to sort the wheat from the chaff for judgment were traditionally understood to be His angels. So what's interesting about this transitory scene from chapter 9 into 10 in Matthew is the way in which Jesus uses the language of harvest, but for the purpose of mercy rather than judgment. It's fascinating when you see what He's doing with the text. Matthew writes, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, for they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Wow. Only after Matthew writes those words does he tell us that Jesus began to say, the harvest is plentiful. 
which means that Jesus looks at the people of Israel, His people, and He sees helplessness. He sees bondage. He sees those who were harassed and overburdened. He sees those who are, in a word, lost. He sees those in desperate need of deliverance. Now, was there plenty worthy of judgment? There certainly would be, of course. Was there sin to condemn? Absolutely. But that is not what Matthew says was Jesus' focus or His heart in this moment. Jesus sees brokenness, and what happens? He's moved to compassion. Jesus knows the people do not need someone to scold them. They need someone to save them. He sees the difference. This is why He gives His ministry of deliverance to the apostles. They are to go to the house of Israel and do what? Proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and then heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out the demons. You received without paying, so give without pay. Which means that the kingdom of heaven is about deliverance. This is the number one kingdom value, healing, liberation, cleansing, resurrection. This is the king's business, and this is what the apostles are being entrusted with. The apostles were not given a mission other than Jesus' mission. They were given His mission, and they were therefore given His authority to carry it out in His name. I remember I used to carry an American Express credit card that had our company name on it. And, but before that, you know, before it says, you know, American Express, Sweet Home California, there's a name. It, the, car, the card's actually in someone's real name. It's in Johnny Fisher's name, right? So I had this credit card that was mine all the time, and I was supposed to use it in ways that advanced the business plan, and I, he trusted me to have it. I remember there was no question as to how much, was, how much credit line there was, right? Uh, it was just get things done. We have to spend money to make money. I trust you. Go get it done which means that I felt empowered to be on the mission that I was on, right? How do you think I felt when I had to go to Staples or when I had to go rent an office or when I had to go, you know, spend some amount of money that I didn't have in, order, in the process of doing business? I didn't feel alone or like I had to come up with it. I was given somebody else's name and authority to get the work done. That's essentially what's being, being done here in them. Johnny did not send me out to do his business with my resources. No, I was given His financial power alongside His responsibilities. In the same way, these apostles do not go out in their own name or in their own power, but in Jesus' name and in His power to accomplish His mission. And here's sort of what's interesting about this right now. The Lord might ask you to do something someday, and I'm terrified of what you said. Uh, over here about being called to the front lines of something. The Lord might ask you to do something someday, and you will look and you will say, oh, don't have the resources. <laughs> I can't do that. Oh, what a shame, Jesus. What a shame. Just missed me. I can't do that. And He'll say, oh, no, no. That's not how I work. Not how I work at all. Haven't you been reading? Right? If I send you out to do something in my name, I will send you in my power and you'll do it through me. The Lord Jesus might ask us to do something someday, and we might say, I can't, and we'd be right. But we would not, therefore, have an excuse, for if the Lord is really going to send, He is really going to supply. These disciples were once bystanders, weren't they? But then they were called. These disciples were following behind Jesus, but now they're being sent out ahead of Jesus to lead others as apostles. These people were once likewise prisoners to the kingdom of sin and darkness and self. But then Jesus delivered them by the power of His own Word and His own works. And now they bring Jesus' message of a radical, total, fundamental transformation. And what will start with miraculous power 
will be, com- will be carried to completion in meaningful change. As Christians, we are sent into a world that deserves the same judgment that we deserve, but for whom Jesus has boundless compassion. And as a result of that compassion, nothing short of total deliverance from sin and from its consequences is on offer. Think of those four categories that Jesus sends them out to operate in. Each of them has to do with some aspect of the consequence of sin, whether it be resurrection because of death, uncleanness because of sin and separation, whether it be sickness as understood as uh, sort of the perversion of human health in the, in, the, in the fallen creation. Each of them has something to do with sin, and each of them is going to be addressed in His power to deal with sin. So, Jesus does not save you from one consequence of sin and allow you to stay in the, re- the others. Right? He's doing a total transformation in the end. So, the apostles go as those carrying the ministry of deliverance, but they go as those characterized by the ministry of dependence, of dependence. Notice how Jesus gives specific terms for the way in which they're going to carry out His mission and the way they're going to deliver His message. These apostles will not go on this journey in the strength and resources that their self could supply. No, they are going out as a living picture of dependence upon God. That's why there's a description as to how they're going to go. You received without paying, so give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. If if they had received without paying and therefore will give without pay, how the heck are they going to survive? They might be asking that question. They're going to rely upon the hospitality of other people. And that reliance upon hospitality of other people, it's an important part of their mission, actually. Not only because it shows their dependence upon God to provide, but also because it provides an ample test for those who will be given opportunity to receive them. You see, the apostles are functioning here as prophets sent from God to Israel. That's the picture that's being picked up. How will they be received? And prophets were always recognizable because they relied upon God for their provision. They relied upon God for their provision, and they relied upon God for their protection as well. Provision and protection. And how one treated the prophets that God sends is, in effect, how one is treating God. These apostles are going to go out in the name of Jesus in order to proclaim the kingdom and demonstrate their reliance upon Him from the provision of their needs. And Jesus says the result of all this will be that His apostles will be what? They will actually be delivered over to those who oppose the message. They're going to be dragged before authorities, civil and religious And Jesus says not to worry in this instance, but to know that God will protect them and give them what? Give them the words to speak. And if they're to be killed for the message, as some undoubtedly could be, they are not to fear those who can only kill the body. But instead, they should fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell, which Here's the the cash value of that. Death is no longer the trump card for an apostle. There are fates worse than death. And Jesus is in control of those fates. He's the one you should be looking to. When death is thrown out as the trump card that the world can always throw, and it's the most the world can ever throw is death, then Jesus has something further. Death is no longer the trump card for an apostle. It's merely part of the portfolio of the ministry of dependence. They are to depend upon God even beyond the boundary of death. And this is really important for us to grasp. Jesus is saying 
that being part of His kingdom means that the claims of every other kingdom, all enforced by temporal violence, are nothing compared to the claims that He lays upon us. As was mentioned with the Ukrainian pastors, if, is there any way you could stay back? Well, then who else would go? Who else would go? The only rationale to get to there is because if that pastor should die, they are not lost, right? There's no other way to, get, to go into a war zone for God's kingdom mission except if you truly believe that if you die, you are not ultimately lost. And that's proof positive of the understanding of this claim. And that's, that's very, very important to understand. This is happening in the world now that people are understanding what this means. Furthermore, Jesus says to give this message away to all people freely because they had freely received it, which means that as Christians, we are free to give away the gospel because we have had our needs met by God's gospel. You ever think about that? It's fascinating. We are free to give away the gospel because we've had our needs met by the gospel, which means that the freedom of life we demonstrate is the freedom we have been sent out to offer to other people. They are a living testimony of their own message. The ministry of deliverance is being delivered by those who have been delivered and who are modeling a life of dependence upon the one who does the delivering. And if ever there were a unifying, inclusive message for all people to respond to, this would be it. And yet, the kingdom message carries with it the ministry of division, the ministry of division. Because other than the threat of death, this is the other burden that every apostle is bound to bear up and to carry. The word preached will divide the world into two camps. On the one hand, there will be those who reject this message and the kingdom and therefore its king. Why? Very simple, the bottom of things, very simple, because the king isn't them. And what will that rejection ultimately cost such people? Jesus says in verse 14 of 10, if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. There's an unthinkable cost to rejection. There's a cost to rejection. To reject the king's deliverance and provision and protection is to remain in sin and to embrace its consequences. That's the logic of God's wrath in the world. It's something, you know, as we've said, uh, that is chosen, even if it is final. It's a, there's a cost to rejection. It's the rejection of the gospel that leaves one in their sins. And Scripture says that the wages of sin is what? Death, Romans 6, 23. So Jesus' message is that He comes to pay those wages on our behalf at the cross. Why? So that He can represent us before the Father who sits in judgment over the earth. And when the Father sees us, He sees Christ who has given us His righteousness and taken our sin. So the cost of rejecting these apostles is the embrace of an earned judgment before God. And yet for all who will receive these apostles and thereby receive their Lord, they will receive the consolation of reception, the consolation of a warm reception. Jesus says in verse 32, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Anybody who denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. The logic is very simple. It's as simple as that, which means that as Christians, we bring a message from God which forces a decision from other people. We come into the lives of others as God's agents, bearing the world's ire and the world's hope. 
I've been talking to many of you as you've been l learning to share the gospel maybe for the first time in your life, or if you've had many years of doing it and you're sharing tips at this point, one thing that you have in common is that you, you experience the weight of this reality, that to share the gospel is to walk into the ire of the world as it is rejected, and yet you go into that with a sense of hope, right? And the person who you're sharing the gospel with almost is working up the courage to have the hope to believe you, right? There's something within them that rejects what you're saying, and yet if the Spirit is working, there is something within them that would dare to hope that what you're saying is true. And as the Spirit is working that out in the life of this person, you are in the washing machine of their relational processing, right? Sometimes you get hit by something in there, right? Some, it, someone might say something to you, and you go, I don't know if I want to keep talking to you. That was, I think I'm done sharing the gospel with you. <laughs> and then someone else might just be wide open. They've been waiting years for someone to share the, the hope of the gospel, and they're ready to respond, and it's a beautiful thing. But nonetheless, these apostles are going out wide-eyed, aren't they? They've been told in advance what's going to happen when you bring this message of deliverance into the world. So, as Christians, we bring the same message, and we accept that it forces a decision from others. The ministry of deliverance and dependence and division, the sent ones are sent with nothing less. And the Lord is sending you and the Lord is sending me, not to the house of Israel as prophets, but out into the lives of our neighbors, maybe onto the lawn tomorrow. How will we be received? God knows. But it is ours to go with God. Three things that we would do. It fits with the, with the template here as we go with God. I think it looks like this. When we go with God, we are to go to deliver the message of deliverance from sin and its consequences. No surprise, that's the core of the gospel. That's what we are saying. Now, you might be doing this in your home context. You might be doing this in your literal home. Jesus says sometimes this will divide your actual family. There will be some people in your family who accept this, some people in your family who reject this. I think this is one of the most tender parts of our lives as Christians, as we are trying to navigate the long-range impact of this message in our own families. And yet, Jesus says, stay, stay tight, I'll give you the words to speak in this space, in your home. Sometimes it's at your work, right? I know I've worked various jobs prior to being a pastor, so I, contrary to what you might think, I, I have worked before, and I know the feeling. <laughs> I know the feeling of like saying, I would like to just keep this a work relationship. I don't necessarily want to tell you too much of who I am or what I really think. I would like to get in and get out. Thank you very much. Nine to five. Let's keep it that way. And yet something about the gospel will sneak into your nine to five. People will start to know who you are. This has started happening to me at the paintball field. They don't like this. I was sitting out there uh, eating my lunch and someone walked by and made a prayer joke. They said, are you, are you leading a prayer over here? Are you leading a Bible study? right, because word got out. I said, no, not yet, but next week, right? It's now that you all know it's going to happen. So, this message of deliverance from sin is going to get into your home, and it's going to get into your work. It might get into your school. It's going to get into anywhere that you have to go, and you're going to have to carry the burden of delivering it, right, with all of the ire and all of the hope that it, that it entails, and as you go with God and deliver the message of deliverance, you will do so by demonstrating the message of dependence upon God. Because here's what people are going to do. They're going to look at the message of deliverance, which has all the words like sin that they think they know, but what they're going to test is your life. They think they know the message, they're going to test your life. They're going to look at the way you live over a long range, and they're going to try to see if, you, if your life is actually dependent upon God, if it's if it connects with the message that you're speaking or not. Um, for better or worse, I've had both reports. I've had the, what, you're a Christian? And the, you're the Christian I respect. I've had both in my life, right? I've been a Christian long enough to have earned both of those at various times. But demonstrating the message of dependence upon God goes with delivering the message of deliverance from God. And here's what you'll have to do as you get used to stepping into this. As you go with God, you're going to have to decide to accept 
the terms of God's divisive message of unity. It's a divisive message of unity in Christ. There's going to be a temptation as you share the gospel to say, well, if I could just if I could just round out this one part over here, maybe this person who doesn't like that aspect of the gospel will come a little bit closer. Maybe if I downplay this doctrine about sin or this aspect uh, that seems judgmental to them, then, then maybe they'll be a little bit more attracted to the gospel and then I'll get them, right? There's that temptation, but it's false. It's not how the gospel works. Right? On the other hand, there will be those whose sin you particularly don't like and you will say, you know, repent and believe the gospel and think you've done your job just by bringing enough condemnation into their life. And that's wrong as well. There's temptations on both sides of this that are not the way that it's really meant to be done. We have to accept God's terms of division for the gospel in the world. It is only His terms that will produce the true unity of the reception of that gospel when it is received, whether that be at home or at work or at school wherever. Just like I learned how to steward the priorities of my friend and employer, Johnny, may we represent Jesus in a way that's faithful to His message and faithful to His life. We saw how Jesus entrusted the apostles with the ministry of deliverance, sent them out in the ministry of dependence to walk out the ministry of division. And we concluded by considering what it would mean for us to go with God. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank You that You sent Your Son to gather us in, that having addressed the business that needed to be addressed with Your people, Israel, Your mercy overflowed to reach us, the Gentile world that You have have compassion for us, that You would save us from our sin rather than allow us to suffer its consequences eternally. That is Your heart. That is what You seek to do. In Your Spirit, would You guide us into that truth? Would You empower us as we go out into the world with that message of deliverance in the name of Jesus? Would you give us a confidence that comes only from that name, a holy boldness, to face whatever fears the world would throw at us, knowing that they have been overcome in this name of Jesus. And it's in His name we pray. Amen.